and welcome back. And today we're back to working on that PDP-1103 power supply. Now, normally whenever I make a video, I don't like to do two of the same topic in a row. I try to stick to a rotation. So I'll do like, say a video on the Bendix, then I'll do one on the Centurion, then maybe the PDP, then the UE-1, then I'll circle back around to the Bendix and the cycle starts over again. I do this for a bunch of different reasons, but the biggest one is burnout. I'm trying to avoid burning out on a particular project. And this also helps keep continual progress happening on multiple projects. Uh, but, <laughs> well, today I was planning on doing a Bendix G15 video. It's just too cold to do that. Uh, in this room right now, it's 55 Fahrenheit. Outside, it's about 20 Fahrenheit. It's an absolutely frigid day here in Texas. And the minimum operating temperature that you can use the Bendix in is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything below that and you risk a head crash because the aluminum casing is going to shrink the heads into the titanium drum. And what we need to do on the Bendix is drum related. We need to get the drum out, try to get some new grease into the bearings to revive the bearings on it. So I don't want to do that when it's this cold in this room. Also, I've been losing sleep on this PDP-11 power supply, man. <laughs> it just whipped me up and down last week. And uh, well, I'm coming back at it armed with fresh knowledge, fresh information, and a lot of excellent uh, suggestions from you guys, the viewers. You guys left a ton of great comments on the previous episode. And I think armed with all of this newfound knowledge, we can finally crack it. We can get that uh, power supply up and going. So I'm gonna pull the power supply out put it over on the bench and let's first talk about how this power supply works because I think I finally got a grasp on how it actually works. And uh, then we'll throw some parts at it, flip some switches and hopefully get some good power rails out of it at the end. And uh, if it all goes smoothly, we may even plug the uh, 1123 CPU card and memory card into it and hopefully get into some diagnostics or something like that. That's the ultimate goal, but uh, really, I'll be happy if I just see a good 5 volt and a good 12 volt rail coming out of this thing. So let's hop over to the bench and get started. Before we get into throwing some new parts at this and flipping the switch, which we're definitely going to do because my, uh, <laughs> my order got here, I have new parts to put into it. But before we do that, let's uh, revisit the manual to see exactly how this power supply is working because I think I have a much better grasp on it now than I did in the previous episode. There's essentially three large blocks that build up the power supply. There's a uh, regulator circuit that takes an unregulated voltage and brings it down to a very specific regulated voltage. There is an overcurrent protection circuit that has a sense uh, resistor in it that detects a voltage drop across it. If there's too much current, it shuts down the regulator circuit, resets it, and tries again. And then there's a crowbar circuit that uses a Zener diode to set a reference voltage. If the output voltage goes above that, it clamps that output voltage to ground, uh, which causes a massive amount of current to flow through the sense resistor on the overcurrent protection, and that shuts down the regulator. So the three of these all kind of work in a really cool harmony, and I think it's a really neat design. This is kind of my first deep dive into this style of power supply design. I really like it. But what I couldn't quite grasp in the previous episode was how the basic regulator circuit works. So I've got that page right here in the manual, and I think I'm finally starting to wrap my head around it. Now, even though it uses a 7805 linear regulator, this is not a, a linear power supply. It is a switch mode power supply that uh, runs at about 10 kilohertz. Um, but they're using the 7805 in a really interesting way. At extremely low currents, anything less than 50 milliamps, the 7805 does all of the work. It is in that situation a pure purely linear supply. We have a uh, voltage coming in through R27, through the control transistor, goes into the input of our three terminal regulator. The three terminal regulator regulates that to five volts, throws it out the output, and we're good to go. The rest of the uh, circuit here is completely ignored. So this means that we can actually run this power supply with no load on it. But if the load becomes too great, well, now the 50 milliamp limit of the 7805 itself, the way this thing is designed, is not going to cut it. So what ends up happening is the excess load starts to pull that output voltage lower, which means that the uh, 7805 
tries to conduct more and more, and it pulls in more and more voltage through R27 and the control. Now, as that voltage drop across R27 gets greater and greater, it actually turns on the driver transistor. When the driver transistor turns on, it in turn turns on the pass switch. When the pass switch turns on, it allows 24 volts of unregulated DC to pass through it, past the snubber network, through the L2 inductor, past the current switch, and out onto the 5 volt output. This is a lot more voltage, a lot more power, and it starts to bring that 5 volt output up. It's going to charge up the uh, filter capacitors that are on it, and it's going to bring the voltage above 5 volts. Now, when this happens, the 7805 is suddenly happy. So it starts pulling less current, and as it pulls less current, the voltage drop across R27 also drops, which turns off the driver transistor, which turns off the pass switch, and now the unregulated DC voltage is no longer being supplied. L2 is a large inductor, and when it is combined with the filter capacitor on the end, this kind of creates a supply of uh, voltage. So it can continue supplying current to the load, and uh, it does that for a little bit of time until, well, the inductor has supplied all it, all it has, the capacitor has supplied all it has, the voltage level on that 5 volt output starts to fall again, the 7805 tries to uh, supply more current, creates more voltage drop across R27, turns the pass switch on, and the cycle repeats. And it repeats at 10 kilohertz. That's a pretty cool way to do it. But there's a pretty interesting thing here in that the ground of the 7805 isn't actually technically ground. We can see it goes over to this interesting voltage divider. Essentially what this does though is it allows you to adjust the output of the uh, final voltage rail that's going out up or down to give you more or less voltage by creating a floating ground. Uh, all of this really fancy stuff down here is probably totally fine, but there is something quite important, and that is that it does create a voltage divider, but not to ground to minus 15 volts. Minus 15 volts is one of the voltage levels that I did not check. So if we look at this page here, this is the unregulated section of the power supply. We flip the AC switch on, it goes through the power transformer, then it goes through a couple of rectifiers, and it generates uh, AC voltage for logic signal generation. It generates the plus 24 volts for the unregulated power. We know that's working fine, we've seen that. And then it has a three terminal regulator to uh, generate a regulated 5 volts. This is going to be another 7805, and that 5 volts is purely for the logic ICs on the power supply itself. But also, there's another 3 terminal regulator, a 7915, to generate minus 15 volts. If this 7915 is bad, we are not going to see minus 15 volts, which means that on our regulator circuit here, our ground is not going to be around ground. It's going to be at some elevated voltage. Maybe it's sitting at one volt or something like that. And if that's the case, everything is going to try and overvolt. So we have a bunch of stuff that we need to check, but I think chief among it is checking that the minus 15 volt rail is good. So I'm gonna pull out the uh, multimeter and we're gonna test that first. So that way we know what kind of mountain we have to climb. All right, the 7805 is right here and the 7915 is right up here. These are the two linear regulators that should be supplying the five volts for the internal logic as well as the negative 15 volts. So we should see 24 volts coming into the 7805. 26 volts, a little high, but that's fine. The middle pin should be ground, and then we should see five volts coming out of it. Excellent, that's exactly what we're expecting. Now let's check the 7915. We should see uh, some input and some output here. 0 0.679 volts, that's a weird number. 0 0.553 volts. And uh, that's, that one's clearly ground there. Um, wow, okay. So, <laughs> uh, that's not good. We are, whew, Shaka when the walls fell, man. So Kath, his eyes uncovered. So we're not generating anything what's supposed to happen here. Uh, okay, so either the 7915 is bad or something related to the 7915 is bad. So let's pull the 7915 out and see if that revives this a little bit. 
And while I've got the soldering iron hot, I'm going to go ahead and repopulate the entire power supply. In the previous episode, we removed the control transistor, driver transistor, and pass transistor, all in an effort to try to figure out what was causing the weird overvoltage we were seeing. Those components may still be good, but they've already been removed, so it doesn't make sense to put old components back in, especially when I've got brand new stuff sitting right here. For the 12 volt rail, I replaced the 7812 control transistor, driver transistor, and pass transistor. For the 5 volt rail, I replaced just the driver transistor and pass transistor, as that was all I had previously removed. With all those fully repopulated and the board looking complete again, I'll go ahead and swap in a new 7915 negative voltage regulator. Everything should be back to some semblance of normalcy. Let's uh, give this 7915 a try and see if we're getting uh, minus 15 volts now. Ooh, 0.7, that's a very different voltage than I was expecting. 0.5 and 12 millivolts, that's about the same as what it was doing before. So we have a problem somewhere else that's uh, causing an issue here, I think. All right, definitely strange that the 7915 is behaving funny. So I took a look at the schematic here. There's not much between the 7915 and the transformer. And we know the transformer is good because everything else is working. So the only other things between them are these two diodes and a couple of capacitors. One of these capacitors is the one that we replaced in the previous episode. And the two diodes are right here. And uh, well, I think we have multiple problems with these. If I check uh, the diode check on one of them here, you can see uh, 0 0.002 volts. If I flip around to the other side, we get the same result. Um, so I think that we have maybe a shorted diode. Uh, also, if we rotate the entire power supply up, these two diodes are connected by a trace that is completely burned out. So we need to repair that trace, and I think we need to desolder and uh, check and or replace those diodes. To get the diodes out, I'll first desolder them with my trusty Radio Shack desoldering iron. The proximity to the metal frame of the supply makes it a little awkward though, which meant the diodes were still a little stuck in place. So I flipped the supply over and tried to free them from the top side when this happened. Because I'm a barbarian, that didn't go smoothly. I managed to break uh, two diodes in completely in half. One of them was totally unrelated, uh, and I only managed to get one out unscathed, so yay. Uh, but these are just one in 4004s, and I have three replacements, so we should be totally fine. I did check this one with the multimeter, and uh, it's totally shorted. So this was absolutely a problem. All right, new diodes in with the new 7915. Let's, let's give it a test. Boy, I hope this works. Uh, okay. Negative 14.85. We have, we have a negative voltage. We have minus 30 feeding into it, and it is getting uh, regulated down to minus 15.85. Uh, regulated up to. Negative voltages are weird. But... That's excellent news. That means that it might actually be working. Let's lay this thing on its side and give that a test. All right, everything is a little precarious, but I think you guys should be able to see everything here. So we'll go ahead and flip the AC on. Saw the run light uh, flash momentarily and then go off. This is the moment of truth. If we flip this switch here. Oh, I can still hear it cycling. <laughs> Dang it. Okay, I did some more hunting around and there was one more resistor that had burned up as a result of me taking some of the uh, transistors out. I have replaced that transistor and I've got it all back together. I think this thing should work now, but if it doesn't, uh, I've got the scope hooked up so we can at least see how it's behaving. Um, and then maybe that'll give us an indication of where to look. So we'll go ahead and flip the power switch on on the back here. Okay, <laughs> here goes nothing. We got a, we got a red light. Look at that. Yes. It works. 
That's five volts, that's 12 volts. We've got DC okay on the front here. This thing is producing voltage and I don't have a load on it. So there we go, definitive proof that this power supply design, despite being a switch mode power supply, does not need a load to come up and work correctly first. Now we haven't put uh, any stress on the switch mode part of it, so we need to switch this off and actually put a load onto it to test that part of it, but that is excellent news. DC okay. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right, let's load it up and uh, see what happens. I've got a two ohm load on the five volt and a 10 ohm load on the 12 volt. And uh, I think that should stress them enough without pushing them beyond their limits. And uh, hopefully we still see clean uh, five volt and 12 volt up here. I have the digital multimeter on the five volt rail, so that should uh, tell us what it's sitting at. Let's uh, give this a test. Yes. Yes. Look at that, 4.95 volts. Looks like a clean five volts, a clean 12 volts up there. This power supply is back to working 100%. I just need to attach all of the uh, bracketry here, get it back up to looking nice and clean. We'll test it one more time and then uh, start plugging cards into it. This, oh, that's awesome. One extra thing I want to try right quick is reviving this gummed up cooling fan. I'll peel off the sticker to hopefully give me better access to everything, but it looks like a pretty heavily sealed design. Regardless, I'll try to work some oil in there and slowly move it in and let it soak in. And it's definitely better than it was. It actually spins up now. That power supply is now working at 100%. Even with a pretty heavy load on it, it's still just is totally rock solid stable. That is awesome. We got it going. Oh, that feels good. <laughs> but why did it why did it take so long to get here? It took an episode and a half to get this power supply up and going. And uh, well, let's recap. What actually went wrong? Initially, I thought that there was a problem in the regulated circuit, but it turns out that the problem was much earlier than that. It was in the minus 15 volt system. And I didn't think to check that. I should have. That's one of the very first things I should have checked, but I, it just didn't dawn on me because I was unfamiliar with the construction of the regulator that's in this power supply. So we had a failure really early on and uh, actually it's interesting to say early on because I'm pretty sure that failure happened long before I ever got my hands on this power supply. When I first got it, it was in pieces. It was a literal basket case across several baskets. The card cage was separated from it. The uh, big filter capacitor was hanging on by a thread. The front panel was in a completely different box. I mean, somebody had tried to troubleshoot this power supply before many years in the past. And so I was starting on the back foot already, but it doesn't matter because we got it going. We're up and running. It has good voltage levels on it. We get DC okay on the front. That means it's time to start plugging cards into it because I trust this power supply not to destroy one of these. So we're going to plug the CPU card in. We're going to plug the memory card in. We're going to flip the switch and make sure that the LEDs on these cards come up. And then maybe we'll try plugging a terminal in and see if we can get any life out of these cards at all. This is pretty exciting. <laughs> let's, well, let's do this. All right, first proper power up. I've got the uh, CPU card in, the memory card in, and I think we're ready to throw some electrons at it and see what happens. All we're expecting to uh, see on this is the power okay LED come on, and then some of the LEDs on the uh, CPU board here do something. We don't have a terminal hooked up to it, even though the CPU board does have the console terminal port on it. Uh, we're just looking to see for signs of life. So we'll go ahead and flip the AC on here. My, uh, my AC fan is a little grumbly here. Uh, it is cold in the room though, so maybe that'll uh, <laughs> get a little quieter as we warm up. But here goes nothing. We'll flip the uh, restart switch on the front here. We got power okay. We've got four LEDs up here. We've got a green LED on the memory board. That is signs of life. I don't know what the four LEDs is supposed to mean, but uh, I think we should plug a terminal into this if we can figure out the pinout and uh, see what's happening. Oh, that's really exciting. <laughs> 
I couldn't actually find the pinout of the plug in any of the official deck documentation. Thankfully, gunkies.org has a stunningly good wiki with a ton of information on the PDP-11. They had the full pinout of the 10-pin plug listed, as well as excellent information about how to wire it up for RS-232 use. To make the cable, I salvaged a 10-pin female connector from a different cable and crimped it to a new cable of the right length. Pin 7, the negative side of a differential receive pin, needs to be connected to pin 9, which is internal ground. And then pin 2 is the RS-232 ground, pin 3 is transmit, and pin 8 is receive. That's it, just three simple wires to get full RS-232 communication working. To make it nice and tidy, I'll route the cable underneath and then hold it in place with the cable clamps on the back of the card cage. Finally, I need a data terminal to test it with, and I think this ADM3A that we restored in a previous episode will work perfectly. All right, we've got a data terminal out, hooked up. I'm pretty sure I've got everything wired up correctly. I've also been pouring over the manual here to double check that the dip switches and jumper settings are set correctly. Well, correctly set to the baud rate and bit width that I want, which I'm pretty sure is 9608 in one. That's what they already set to. So I've got the terminal set to that as well. Oof, <laughs> let's give it a shot. There goes AC. That fan is still grumbly. I may end up just disconnecting it completely, but uh, let's do restart here. One, seven, three, zero, zero. We have life. We have life. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get this thing to uh, misbehave a little bit. Uh, whenever I hit the restart switch here, we get to one, seven, three, zero, 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 and an et symbol. Uh, this, I believe, is ODT which is on disk diagnostics or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but I think this is essentially like a memory monitor. I don't know how to use this. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to turn it off. We're going to flip the halt switch on uh, or off, I guess, because up, I think, is off. And then we'll hit restart again. <laughs> oh, yes, there we go. All right. KDF11B ROM version 0 0.9, error 1, no memory, error 6, trap 10, 173414. Uh, okay, looks like it's not detecting our 256k of memory that's in there. That could be indicative of a fault on the memory, or it could be that the uh, CPU has a jumper set up to look for a different type of memory. Maybe it's looking for uh, 22 bits of 4 megabyte memory or something like that. So I'm going to need to dig back through the manual uh, before we can break that uh, error 1. I have no idea what error 6 trap 10 is. Again, I'm going to have to dig back into the manual for that. All right, digging through the manual, it seems that the uh, memory card here has like 9 million different things that you can change to make it do all sorts of different things. Uh, but uh, at the very last page of the installation guide here, it just has a page that says uh, general jumpers. And uh, looking through this, um, two to Y, uh, out is a 22-bit machine, in is an 18-bit machine. And that's going to be these two jumpers right here. They are not connected. Unfortunately, there's a jumper between them, and you're supposed to wire wrap those. So I need to wire wrap two to Y. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a wire wrap tool. So this is, this is going to get a little interesting. Let's see if I can figure out a good way to do this. All right, my solution, while not as elegant as wire wrap, I think we'll get the job done. I just uh, soldered up a little jumper that sits over it. I had to shave it down a little bit to make sure it cleared, but it does clear. So let's go ahead and hit restart here. Uh, yeah, we still got 173000 uh, there. Um, we'll flip the uh, re restart off, flip the halt switch up, restart up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, 248 kilobytes of memory, nine step memory test, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Total memory errors, zero. That is excellent. Uh, boot switch S1 incorrect, type question mark for help. Uh, let's do map here and see what that shows us here. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> CPU options, EIS. Uh, there's our starting and ending address, and uh, there's our memory map. <laughs> This is working perfectly. That's awesome. <laughs> there we go. The PDP 1123 Plus with 256K of memory is working perfectly. The power supply over here definitely sent us down a rabbit hole, but we got there. It is working excellently. The only thing that's still wrong with it is uh, that one fan that I tried to revive. It's just 
not great. Uh, so right now it's currently unplugged, even though it's still in situ. Uh, and we're just gonna run it with one fan for a while uh, until I can find a replacement for that one. But <laughs> there it goes, it works perfectly. Now we do still get an error message that says incorrect uh, jumper setting. And I can see here on the CPU board that we have a wire wrap jumper that has been broken. So maybe that's what it's talking about. I'm gonna need to dig deeper into that. But uh, this is an excellent start for our mobile PDP-11. And uh, you know what guys, I've, I've seen the metrics. Uh, around 60% of viewers of these videos click away whenever I start these closing sections. So for the 30% of you that remain, this is now just a chat between you and I. And uh, well, the rest of those guys are gonna miss out because, um, well, as you can see, the ADM3A here is a gorgeous terminal, but it's not very portable. It's not a great mobile terminal. And I'm trying to build a portable PDP-11 here. So I need a proper, portable terminal and that is what this big beast is and if we open it up on the front here look at that oh it's so gorgeous it's so good so this is the portable terminal that we are going to pair with our portable pdp 11 build going forward we also need to build some drives for this i i want to put an eight inch floppy drive on it and a half height five and a quarter inch flop or hard drive on it so that way we have uh just a little bit more height but we have full-on hard drive and floppy drive capability and we'll plug it into this big boy here and we can have the two of these set up on a table with ease at any event. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and uh, hanging on with me as I try to figure out the insane power supply in this. The portable PDP-11 build here, I'm super excited for, mostly because of this gorgeous terminal that uh, Godfrey hooked me up with. Thank you, Godfrey, for watching. Uh, so again, thank you guys so much for uh, hanging out past the 60% uh, that click away, and I hope to see you in the next episode.